Okay, so this conversation is all going to be about mental diet or our information diet and the importance of that. It's all about pay attention to what you pay attention to. Because there are many indirect ways in which this stuff affects us. So we want to be able to understand and manage indirect factors in negative emotions, uh, but also in bodily tension and physical aches and pains. Um, we want to be able to liberate ourselves from the influences that hold us back and create difficulties in life. And we want to develop mental efficiency, mental strength, and unshakable inner peace. And this will give us a tool to help manage some of those things. So the first thing we should do is uh, a self-assessment just to see how relevant this is to each of us. So it's a five uh, statement self-assessment. We're gonna go through five items and you rate everything on a scale of one to five. So I'm gonna make a statement and you give it a one if it applies to you almost never. A two if it applies to you occasionally a three if it applies to you about half the time, a four if it applies to you fairly often, and a five if it applies to you almost always. So this is a self-scoring just to see how relevant this might be to you at this particular moment in life, okay? So statement number one is this. I find myself getting nervous or frustrated. I find myself getting nervous or frustrated. So one, give it a one if it's almost never, two for occasionally, three for about half the time, four fairly often, five almost always. We just want to know what our number is there on, I find myself getting nervous or frustrated. How about anxiety? Yep, that would be nervousness. Uh, well, I, I mean, I do have feelings of worry is going to be number three. So. Um, yeah, just nervousness or frustration. So you just give yourself a score. All right. Number two. Now I find myself indulging in negative thoughts, indulging it. So if it's almost never give yourself a one, if it's occasionally give yourself a two, if about half the time you're indulging in negativity, give yourself a three. If it's fairly often, give yourself a four. If it's almost always, give yourself a five, right? Now, number three is I experience feelings of fear or worry. Fear or worry. And once again, just score that on a scale of one to five. One means almost never, two occasionally, three half the time, four fairly often five almost always. Now, number four is going to be, I experience physical or nervous tension in my body, perhaps aches or pains. Okay. So if you get back pain, you know, shoulder pain, anything like that, um, then this is more relevant. Almost never is a one. Occasionally two, three, half the time, four, fairly often, five, almost always. I'll explain the relevance of that one because people might be like, well, how does mental diet have anything to do with physical aches and pains? And it, it can have a lot to do with it, actually. And we'll go into some real life practical examples that are relatable. And then number five is I find myself losing hope in life or reality. Right. So this could be people are just losing faith in humanity because of everything that's going on in the news and whatnot. Like if you find yourself losing hope in life or reality, just score yourself one to five. All right. And then at the end, you'll have, you're going to tally up your total points and you've got a score out of 25. Okay. Now, obviously a five would be like a perfect self assessment score, just like, having a really good grasp on these things, the higher the score, the more relevant this is. But no matter what your score is, we could all benefit from cleaning up our mental diet and detoxing the unhealthy stuff and nourishing ourselves with the good stuff. When we eat the wrong foods, it starts to show. We may be susceptible to bloating, putting on extra weight, getting acne or getting ill. 
but a decline in our mental diet, like paying attention to too much negative stuff and negative people and, you know, really negative news and really disturbing movies or disturbing music, like all that stuff. You can't always see those effects on the outside. And many people are very skilled at hiding it. Just take a look at Robin Williams. He was super funny, happy on the outside, but was disturbed and struggling on the inside, which is why he killed himself, right? So this stuff is not as easy to catch. Now, mental diet consists of the thoughts you think, the things you pay attention to, and the thoughts you receive from close contact with other people. So we're just gonna go into the more specific dimensions of where mental diet will play out. So number one is through what we read. This could be books, articles, celebrity gossip, right? Text messages we get from people that just disturb us or agitate us, or they're just trying to stir the pot. The newspaper that could be, you know, making big issues out of things and getting you all worried and stuff. So we want to ask ourselves, you know, what is helping and what is hurting? What is bringing us down? What is elevating us and what's bringing our negativity? Or, you know, do you ever go looking for the negativity even? Anyone have any thoughts on what we read as a, as a category? Joel? Um, like how what we read affects our mental space? Yeah, so some of what we read can be junk food. And some of what we read can be health food for the soul. Think of it that way. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think especially with the news these days, I think you're hard pressed to find news that's going to be like, you know, spiritually healthy food. It seems to almost always be some kind of, here's some crap today. Look at the crap. Yeah. Here's another crap. <clears throat> and we could, you know, is it possible you could be in a good mood and then just watch the news and all of a sudden find you're in a bad yeah. mood? That's how it goes every time. In fact, the only way I've found around that is either to find a better, more positive news source, which they're very, very few. There is one or two um, or just to completely avoid it, which isn't entirely responsible because you don't really want to be completely aloof. But again, if you're just there to digest garbage, there's no point to it. Yeah. Excellent. So let's go into category number two is category two is like what we listen to. <clears throat> what we listen to, right? So you wanna be aware of music, radio, podcasts, conversations with people, people's complaints, right? You could make yourself a garbage receptacle for human complainers, right? Audio books, whatever it is, we wanna think about what is helping and what is bringing you down. For example, do you ever listen to aggressive music that makes you angry and gets you worked up? Right. If you're cleaning or whatever and you're just putting on this music, like it might leave a lingering effect on your temperament. Right. Or maybe music that is just sad and blue. Right. Sometimes I need the cure. <laughs> the Sometimes I do. Yeah. So that's category number two. Category number three that I want to ask you all about is what we look at or watch mm -hmm. movies right? When I watch a movie, if I deem that it's junk food, I actually throw it out. I don't even look for anyone to give it to. I'm like, I'm not going to give junk to friends. I just toss it. It's kind of like the rule. Troubling news, once again, comedy performances, right? You know, videos on the internet, our social media news feed, right? So if you're looking at your news feed and you've got a bunch of friends on Facebook or something and they're posting all their they're using it as a, as a way to do the, to purge their own therapy and bring everyone down and voice their complaints about the world and their negative opinions, you know, and we're just opening ourselves to that negativity. That's something we need to be careful with. Do you, want to talk, do you want to talk about any of these subgroups or just kind of keep going through them? Uh, we'll go through them and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of have a conversation about some of it. Yeah. Cool. I'm just going to do a brief, uh, brief take everyone through it. You know, concerts, plays, social media influencers, some will, you know, maybe entertain you, but may not leave a good imprint on you. And some could, right? Troubling or disturbing or disturbing images, even sexy images that can get caught in our minds, right? So we just want to think about, you know, is any of this stuff a time waster? What is helping you be better? What is not helping us, right? We don't want these images of destruction and all these stuff imprinted too strongly on our brain. 
right? Just take a look at like, you know, video games that can be very um, violent, for example, and getting violent imagery and stuff imprinted on our brain, for example. Now, another thing is the environments we spend time in. We can be heavily influenced by the energy of our surroundings, the culture of our surroundings, the norms and expectations of our surroundings. You know, behavior is contagious, sometimes in very surprising ways, right? So have you ever noticed how we tend to go along with a culture of gossip or complaining? Like once other people do it and get you started, it's so much easier to just give into it, right? So all of this stuff has an energy to it. You know, what are the bad environments, the environments that bring you down and how can you avoid them? You know, you might find that going to play poker night with the guys, everybody sits and talks or negative things about, about their wives or their kids, or, you know, when they start getting involved and smoking different things and whatever, as an example, I don't do that, but you know, that might be an example of a toxic environment for some people that's come up that I've heard from people, but you know, you can think about who we spend time with. Now we'll do a, a special talk just about that, our social diet. I call it the old shoe because some people are like an old shoe. Maybe it, it fits comfortable, but it doesn't give you the support, you know, like so. And then persistent thoughts, you know, memories and thoughts. We might be distracting thoughts. We give too much attention to memories. We replay in our head, like rewatching a bad movie. We want to think about those persistent bad thoughts that we're indulging too much in. You know, so there's, there's a lot of different things like this. Like sometimes we'll compulsively watch a TV series we don't like. That's like eating junk food we don't enjoy. Sometimes we're watching war news and it only aggravates and disheartens us and can lead to a negative worldview, right? Sometimes people are sharing outrage inducing articles or social media posts with other people and they're passing on the pain, right? You know, sometimes we're accepting invitations to parties or social events that we don't enjoy, you know? So there's a lot of different things in which this in which this can come to us. Now, here's a question I just wanna ask you guys and get everyone's opinion. Why does mental diet matter? Why should we take it seriously? Why should we take this subject seriously? Joel, you wanna start? Uh, I mean, just from personal experience, um, if you're not careful what you allow into your thought, like it just rules your world. And it's really easy. You know, even, even I consider myself to be pretty watchful of my mental diet. And even with that, I get hopeless. You know, you talked about losing hope in humanity and life yeah. um, and frustration. Like those two are the big scoring ones for me. Like I definitely get frustrated more than I should. And I definitely, you know, it seems like everywhere you look, there's just bad news. And like, how are we going to survive on a planet that we're just killing off and nobody seems to care because everybody's living in their little life of convenience. Perfect. So, cool. um, there are things you can control and there are things you can't control, but where we put our focus on determines what we experience in our day-to-day -day life. So um, yeah, being, being aware of what you're letting in, especially, you know, you talked about complainers, you talked about what we watch, like Netflix to me is a huge one. Like I had this epiphany at some point that if you look at like the majority of what's on things like Netflix, I mean, yeah, there are some documentaries and some feel-good movies, but the majority of it these days seems to be like crime drama or like, uh, you know, like like thriller stuff or like, you know, the stuff of like middle-aged wars. And like, it's just all this like designed to elucidate like tension and anxiety and maybe release or whatever. But it it's not what I would consider to be like healthy, positive, good directions mm -hmm. um or even like you mentioned like facebook posts stuff like that i have noticed a lot lately that like 29 out of 30 times that i see somebody share a perspective on facebook it's not trying to like improve it in some way it's just saying hey this sucks or hey you you people suck for thinking this way or like hey yeah. you know middle finger to you for this it's like i always want to have something that's, that's like hey you know they believe this and there's some, a little bit of truth there and they believe this and there's a little bit of truth there. How are we going to figure this out? Mm -hmm. Instead of like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. Everybody's wrong. It's like, how does that help? Anyway, a little bit off topic, but not, but yeah, it's totally relevant because if you don't filter what you take in, like it becomes your experience. Great. Great. So true or false, the happiness in, um, in the happiness in your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. Who true. says true? Yeah. 
Okay, perfect. True or false? The quality of our thoughts is heavily affected by what we pay attention to. Yeah, what we focus on. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, our entire life experience depends on what we pay attention to and the influences we allow into our life. Mm -hmm. The wrong things, allowing the wrong things into your life can damage your intellect. That's a big deal, right? And your quality of like life and family life and everything. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Steve, do you have anything uh, different to add? Um, well, I think, you know, part of it is, uh, you know, we've just, we seem to have a, a country full of people that can't think anymore. And so what makes all of this difficult is no one is using critical thinking to assess this type of thing, right? To Joel's point, when people keep sharing something, so many people are good at regurgitating bullet points, but not presenting a logical argument, fact-based, you know, with empirical data and saying, this is why, you know, I believe this thing or whatever. So you get a lot of contention of throwing out these, you know, headlines, whatever, you know, kind of like law and order, right? Rip from the headlines and you throw it out and you try to slap other people with it. And a lot of people cannot civilly engage each other and have a discussion or a conversation when there's a difference of opinion. And I think as a society, we've kind of lost that ability to do that. So it just further divides everybody because, you know, if you're right, then I'm wrong and I don't want to be wrong. And if I'm right, then you're wrong. And so you kind of get this thing. But I also think too that you know, you're going to find anything in life that you focus on, right? That's that's just a fact. And we could argue whether or not there's more good or evil in the world right now. But I could focus on inflation. I could focus on, you know, all this other crap. Or I could focus on, you know, my gratitude and the blessings that I have in my life, the things that, you know, I've been able to do. And, you know, I am, I'm not historically an optimistic person, you know, I kind of have spent a lot of my life waiting for the other shoe to drop when crap goes wrong, you know, kind of thing. And I've been trying to break that, you know, over the last eight to 10 years. Um, but, you know, when I journal, the last thing I write in my journal, I call it God's evidence. And I have to find something for the day to show me that God, that God is real. And it could be the sunset. It could be water it could be taking a power nap you know it could be my family whatever it is i have to find something good and positive that shows me god's reality and so that is a tool that i've been using because i can i can go find you know a landfill worth of garbage right now you know i could sniff it out without even trying and a lot of times I have gotten discouraged over stuff when jobs don't work out or, you know, there's car problems or financial or relationship struggles. And, and, you know, you focus on that or you go focus on the good. And so I've been trying really hard to focus on the good because it takes more work, right? Anyone can just tap out and be a chicken shit and go find the bad. That takes no effort, right? Finding the good is like faith. It takes effort and it's easy to dismiss God, universe, creator, whatever you want to call it, because you don't understand it and you don't want to put in the work. Faith takes work. Finding the positive takes work. And, you know, where whatever it, it's like when I go mountain biking, wherever I look, that's where my front tire is going to go. Right. And it, and I, I had this happen to me last year when I did a 34 mile bike ride down in southern Utah in St. George. And I was finishing in the dark and my trail was just a few feet away from about a 50 foot cliff, you know, down into the riverbed below. And I was racing the dark and I was racing a cliff. And I just said, focus down the trail. Do not look at the edge. Focus on the trail. Go, you know, as fast as you can, safely, intelligently, but don't look on the cliff and drift. And I did, you know, and I just kind of bombed right through. But, 
You know, you're going to go wherever you look. You're going to go wherever you focus and pay your attention to. And Perfect. so I'm trying to do better just on, on that. But that does, you know, for me, COVID was really bad in that I stress ate and I boredom ate a lot. And now I'm paying the price for it. And I'm trying to get the weight off. But I lost my focus. And so my brain out of boredom and stress manifested through eating because my refrigerator was 12 feet away, you know? So I, I've got my focus back, I believe, but that definitely is going to dictate the course of your physical life. Absolutely. Okay, great. So um, a lot of what we've heard in there is that a lot of this can open a door to evil influence, right? Sure. It can shape who you become because there are some truly evil influences and we have to use discrimination to avoid them. Right. Does anyone know what toxic incentives are? Toxic incentives? No. It's basically, um, it's basically that people are trying to hit triggers to get your attention to circulate their content. So it adds a level of manipulation to journalism, right? Through toxic incentives. They're actually trying to aggravate you because that can create a successful piece, right? And here's the thing, even if you know this stuff is wrong, if you pay attention to it, it can still work its influence on you, all right? So it still has an effect on you. You know, there is that one story, you know, where an elder tells his grandson that, you know, every choice in life is like a battle between two wolves inside of us. You know, one represents the dark side, like anger, greed, fear, lies, insecurity, ego, negativity. And the other one represents peace, love, compassion, kindness, humility, positivity. And then, uh, and they're competing for supremacy within you. And the, the grandson asks, which wolf will win? And the elder replies, the one you feed. And you feed the good or bad inside you based on what you pay attention to. That's a big deal. You know, um, Gerda, or sorry, no, it wasn't Gerda, it was somebody else, um, once said, Tell me to what you pay attention to, and I'll tell you who you are, right? Gerda, Gerda said, if, if I know how you spend your time, then I know what will become of you, yeah. right? Because we're feeding ourselves with evil or positive influence, and it literally starts to shape who we become. So, you know, our free will in our life is largely determined by the influences we choose and the streams of consciousness we enter as a result of those influences we allow into our life. It's where our free will is working in ways we don't truly understand, largely through our choice of influences. You know, it's one of the most powerful lessons we all need to learn in life is, you know, we're, we have to contend with these disturbing or weakening forces right? So Chris, do you have any thoughts? Why does mental diet matter? Why should we take it serious? Anything different, dad? Mental diet is a discipline. And if it's a discipline, just like physical discipline, if you're not using it, you're losing it. So if you're not disciplining what you're focusing on, because all the negative stuff will just take you by default. So it has its own gravity to it. And as you get absorbed to that gravity, gravity gets stronger. However, if you want to do other things and focus on other things that are more positive, that takes effort. Like you said about the toxic um, attention getting, that's always there. The permission marketing is always there. But in order, but if you don't want to have a poor diet, it requires discipline to have a good diet. It takes action, takes consistent action, no matter how small or how large, but it's a daily action. Even against the negative things coming towards you, you have to spend muscle to focus on positive things to maintain the diet. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, actually, that it's not just the absence of negativity, it's the conscious presence and, and movement towards positivity. Yeah, we're we're gonna talk about that for sure. When we get to the when we get to the action steps, we're gonna talk about do more and do less, right? And that's a great that's a great point. I think another thing is this: uh, so much of this affects our physical health, 
have any of you ever watched a scary movie or film and felt your whole body seize up at the scary parts? Is it possible that if you're watching a scary or disturbing reality unfold before you, a reality in which lots of things are going wrong and lots of poor decisions are being made, that on a physical level, your body is seizing under the surface constantly? Absolutely. And might that be, create more stress and postural tension in the body as well? Yeah, like our, our psychology can become our physiology, right? Pavlov's dogs showed the connection between mind and body. You ring a bell that's associated with food, the dog salivates, right? Yeah. You, you watch something disturbing, the body's tensing, fight or flight response. Yeah, you know? the way one of my teachers would have said it is that uh, HC equals HE, what we hold on in human consciousness is what's evidence in our human experience. Oh, perfect. I love that. Which teacher said that? You got to give him credit. A man named Jack Hubble. Great teacher. Jack Hubble. Credit to Jack Hubble right there. Yeah. I mean, this is how lie detectors work. A change in your thoughts, it makes a physical change. Uh, this is how placebo effect works in science, showing that just believing something will work can make it work up to 30% better. Similarly, there's nocebo. Believing in the negative can lead to a negative physical effect, right? So we know that this stuff can enhance dark moods. You know that everything's got a vibration to it that we, uh, you know, and here's the thing. Instinctively, we protect ourselves physically. We don't let people push us around and control where we go and do bad things to us, you know? But when it comes to the mind, we're so much less disciplined. As Chris said, we hand it over willingly. Like this is something we really need to pay attention to because time is precious. You know, we're so careful about the money we spend out there, but we're not so careful about the time we spend. Money is a renewable resource, time is not, right? We should be more careful about the time we spend. The clock is ticking. We have so much little time left to make the most of this life, right? So now here are some things we need to probably set the record straight on is one, is some people will say, you know, the influences like radio, TV, and music are superficial and harmless, right? It's like sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. This stuff is superficial. It is, it's harmless. Uh, do any of you have any thoughts on that? If it were harmless, we wouldn't all need safe spaces right now. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, look at, uh, I mean, look at, you know, propaganda of, of audio stuff, you know, like, during the world, major world wars and things like that, right? A country occupies, they drive down with megaphones, loudspeakers blaring out, you know, propaganda, that kind of thing. You know, when I, I was uh, living in Italy a long, long time ago, and I had someone uh, that I was spending time with that kept mispronouncing the word to speak. And uh, the word is parlare, and he kept saying parlarle. And it got to the point where I said it one time because I heard him say it so much, even though I knew what the word was and it pissed me off. You know, I was like, knock it off. And, you know, I knew what it was, but I heard it from him, you know, 10, 15, 20 times that my brain slipped up and said it the wrong way. So it absolutely is not without its effects. You know, there, there's a reason that, you know, special forces go occupy a place and do their psyop crap with all this stuff of written and, and audio stuff because it works. You hear it enough, you believe it. Great point. Great point. So Steve brings home the point that even if you know something is wrong, you're not safe from its influence, you know, because we know proper propaganda is wrong. But if you're still taking in the messages, it can still work its influence in the back of your mind. It's like this. Have you ever found yourself singing a song you never liked? Like Macarena or Chicken Dance or Meow Mix theme song, whatever. And then you might be like, when was the last time I even heard that song? 20 years ago? Oh my gosh, it's been spinning in my subconscious this whole time. We can tell ourselves things are fake, that movies are fake. But have you ever watched a scary movie and then been up late at night afraid that there's someone in the house? You know, like the slightest noise and you're like jumping, it still gets to us, even though intellectually we know we're bet, we know better. So Steve 
brings home a good point that the thoughts that go in are the thoughts that come out. Garbage in, garbage out. What goes in will affect our lives no matter how wrong we think it is. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of that in order to live the life, our life the best way we can. Um, Joel, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, unfortunately, my brain right now is just thinking about the Meow Mix theme song. Meow, 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 meow. So thank you for that, Brendan. Yeah, 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 no problem. Chris, any thoughts? Meow, 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 meow. There's the proof, right? That's what you get for priming. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the proof. You know, it leaves an imprint on your memory. It can damage your intellect. This stuff can come out in all kinds of crazy ways. We speak other people's words thinking they're our own words, right? No, but that's I, also, you know, so um, <laughs> I think music, music for one can be medicine. There's lots of music that can just make us feel like everything's going to be okay those songs, but then music can also be mental poison. You know, there was a song, um, according to uh, Swami Kriyananda wrote about this, that there was a song called Gloomy Sunday, and it was banned for radio, from radio, because too many people were committing suicide because of this song. You know, music is a direct contact with your consciousness. It can make people angry, egotistical, sensual, or even impart a sense of hopelessness upon their mind and reality, right? It can have a great influence and in shape. Lyrics can shape our thoughts, right? Just think of that Twisted singer, Sister song, We're Not Gonna Take It. Became like literally like the anthem yeah. for rebellious teens, yes. right? <laughs> you know? So um, it has power. There is such thing as induced negativity. So there can be negative emotions that are aroused in response to a movie, a work of art, a piece of music. Like this is more than surface level. You know, there are influences that are seeking to stir up negative reactions and bring out your dark side, right? It's often designed to disturb your nerves. Harmonies are sometimes deliberately disturbing, right? And rhythms can be deliberately disturbing. And all of this can just add to our, our existing levels of frustration, right, in the world. And, you know, like, have you ever had a scary movie give you a nightmare? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it, it has an effect. You watch a movie, you get a nightmare at night. All of these things, what you read, what you listen to, what you watch, it creates the fabric of your thoughts, right? It creates the fabric of your thoughts. And it also creates the fabrics of your chemistry. Yeah. Because as we're talking about being affected by scary stories or scary movies and you're trying to sleep, if that adrenaline is still in your system and your heart rate's a little higher than what it needs to be for you to go to sleep, you can't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And you're and you're and based on how that those chemicals are affecting you, you may not be looking for a monster underneath the bed, but you're still your body doesn't know any better fight, flight, or freeze, and it might stay in a low-level um, yellow alert status and not be able to sleep until all that adrenaline and cortisol wears off. Yep. Oh, also another point is this, that's a really good one too, is uh, there was a guy named Professor Philip and um, he traced the Werther effect and his research demonstrated that immediately following a front page suicide, the suicide rates increased dramatically in those geographical areas where this story was publicized. Here's why. When people are uncertain, they look to the actions of other people to guide their own actions. So if you're even paying attention to actions that are not wholesome, then in your moments of doubt, you are going to mimic those unwholesome actions, right? Now, there is an opposite side to this, which we will be getting into. First, we need to know that we need to know the reality of threat that comes from the dark side, right? Like, you know, because um, a lot of times people justify that they are safe from it and they make excuses for indulging in it. 
and they don't realize just how real this is, you know? Or they think it's a necessity to pay attention to it. And I think we've all got a greater necessity to be self-honest that if you can't do anything about it, it brings unnecessary negativity into your life. And it takes your intention off the important stuff that you can do something about, right? Because a lot of people will say, oh, it's necessary for me to pay attention to all the negative news in the world. And uh, there are better uses of our time in many cases, right? Because that stuff can damage your intellect, leave a negative imprint on your memory. Even negative people long after they're out of your lives can still affect our thoughts and attitudes in certain situations. So let's talk about the good stuff now. What are some examples of the benefits of a good mental diet? So when we expose ourselves to the good, wholesome, uplifting stuff, how might that play out and how might that benefit us? Um, sorry, my Wi-Fi, I had a power outage and it cut me off. But anyway, um, it's interesting because I find that it affects how I respond to situations. Like if I'm on a good mental diet, when I have a challenge or like I have three kids that are like, you know, young kids. And if they come in like screaming and fighting with each other, if I'm like staring at my phone and in like reactive mode to like news or Facebook or whatever the garbage is, I get really short with them and I regret it later. And I find that if I'm like proactively focused on, you know, spiritual study and maybe like focusing on gratitude like steve said or focusing on i don't know positive things that are you know i'm just trying to um help out with things you know i always respond more kindly um yeah and more positively so it just it has a tremendous effect on how we process the things that happen at any given time perfect so you might say it makes you less stressed out calms the mind can change yeah. our moods and emotions Maybe yep. even changes our filters for reality. So we see things in a different light. Yeah. And I, I had this really interesting thought the other day um, of how to qualify if what I'm doing is something that's going to lead me into a, a higher or a lower state. Um, I was really just asking myself the question over and over again, whether when I was doing things is, is this a blessing activity? Like, is this something that's going to lead me higher? And a lot of times I'd be like, no. And if I could be like, oh, well, I should just, like, it was time to switch gears. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I would, I would catch myself doing something that was like, you know, somebody asked me to pray for them and I was helping them out or I was, you know, taking somebody something or doing something that was helpful. It's like, yes, this is a blessing activity. I should keep doing this. And it, it helps give you a qualifier for how I would, you know, figure out what to spend my time on or not. It's not like a cure all, but it did help. Excellent. So how to qualify what a good influence is you know, we can evaluate the result on us. You know, did it bring me up and elevate me or did it bring me down? Did it move me to the dark or to the light? Who do I want to serve, yeah. the dark or the light? You know, did it make me feel good or did it make me feel bad, right? So we can evaluate the result on us, number one. Evaluate the moral value. You know, for example, maybe you're reading spiritual scriptures and reading or the spiritual masters of people who value high moral standing, then you, you can be more sure it's going to be uplifting and inspiring from those sources, right? You can evaluate the referral source. So, you know, is the person who recommended a movie or a book or something to you, somebody who is, is of high moral understanding and understands that stuff. And then sometimes you can just say, you know, what does your heart tell you? Maybe you look at the cover of a movie or a cover of a music album, and you could just know whether this is going to be more bringing you towards the light or the dark, right? So we can qualify any other thoughts, Chris or Steve on qualifying what a good influence is. I don't think so. I think he had uh, hit the nail on the head about qualifying a good intention. But the importance of a good intention is a primer. Like Joel was saying, that if he's looking at his phone or observing something negative and then his kids come in, he's already primed to be in a negative state. But if his thoughts are focused on something, what will, what is a more blessed activity or is this blessing somebody? When something else happens, he's already primed in a positive state. Yeah. And it yeah. exacerbates in whichever direction you focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. 
great point. So we can use and we can utilize it like a primer. We'll talk about that in a bit. I think one of the things we should also um, we should also mention is that watching movies, shows, plays, performances, listening to music, reading books, reading articles, all of that can be a spiritual practice as they can all be close encounters with the stories of our own lives and very comparable. And they can help us identify the thinking and behavior patterns that maybe are holding us back and inspire better choices for overcoming them, right? Sometimes this content can uh, encourage us to exercise our values a little better and take stock of our commitments in life. You know, the wisdom expressed in certain, like maybe even YouTube videos of speakers we admire and stuff like that and, and films might speak to our current conditions in life and might add clarity to our confusion. We might find new insights and breakthrough perspectives from the content we're indulging in, you know? I, for example, I listened to a, a lady named Asha Naya Swami. She's got a YouTube channel. And I just, even if I'm doing something on my computer, I just put her on in the background and she just keeps dropping wisdom bombs that speak to my life conditions all the time. And, you know, she's not a big deal. She's only got like, compared to like some people on YouTube, she's only got like 10,000 followers or something like that. But she's a big deal to me in my life and to the people that are open to her influence. You know, she just, just feeds people more of that spiritual nourishment, right? So just knowing to do that with intention, right? But, and when we watch films and documentaries and other things, it can be like a passport that gives you access to a different time and a different place so that you can benefit from stories you wouldn't normally have access to. Like I think of the movie, An Octopus Teacher. I love that. I would have never been able to have, have my heart expand to have compassion for an octopus or even think of an octopus in that way, but it opens us up to a greater love to be able to share that experience that was made possible through a film. And so I think in many ways, the filmmakers and content creators out there those who are doing it with the intention of love are really doing some of the most profound work on the planet. So, uh, you know, nothing but honor and respect to those who are taking that work uh, seriously. So let's talk about action steps. What do we need more of in our life right now? Like what thoughts or ideas would benefit me most right now? What should we do moving forward? You know, if you are your own coach here today, knowing what you know about yourself and your situation, what guidance, advice, or suggestions would you give you? Anyone have any thoughts on this? Well, I might say this. I might say, uh, you know, one, we should pay attention to what we pay attention to, right? Self-awareness leads to self-understanding and self-regulation. You know, practice catching yourself, indulging in a poor mental diet and mental junk food and ask yourself, is this helping or hurting? You know, just qualify what you're doing. You know, maybe reading more of the stories of the great saints or doing more uh, spiritual activities and exercise and rest and smiling and selfless service and, and, and all these things can help feed our mind or find entertaining things that are good for you. So what is the best music that's good for you? I'm going to throw that question out there. What do you guys think? What, do you, what is some of your favorite music? That's good for you. Like what harmony evokes a deep, calm feeling of peace, love and happiness instead of anger, haunt or loneliness and whatever. Steve, what's the music that you think truly nourishes you uh, on the deepest level? Uh, I've got uh, a Spotify list that I listen to on Sundays that are uh, people like Laura Story and people that are like gospel singers that are... Um, you know, not rock, it, it's more, you know, like, um, you know, I got, it kind of prepares me if I'm driving to church, whatever. Uh, and there's just a bunch of different people that I've kind of searched out. And, um, you know, their songs are about faith and believing and, you know, God and gratitude and those kinds of things. And so it's both the lyrics and the tune, um, you know, they kind of set a, a good stage. Um, classical music you know some can do that for me as well um some of it is more um i still enjoy it but it's a little more um 
you know, fast paced or whatever, when you get into some stuff, but, um, you know, stuff like that, that really just kind of slows me down. I think more than anything, it just kind of slows me down and it kind of opens my heart and mind and, you know, gratitude comes in more. So that's, uh, I listen to that every Sunday. Like I pretty much turn off, you know, all my rock or, you know, any, anything I would listen to the rest of the week. I don't do on Sundays, you know, trying to just make that, that change. Um, Hmm. But sometimes I'll just flip it on in the drive home, you know, when maybe I'm listening to, you know, Pearl Jam and, uh, and I just think, you know what, I need, I need something a little slower. I need to kind of let God in and, you know, I'll switch it and instantly it'll change my state and kind of put me in a more receptive, um, you know, being at that point. Love it. Love it. Joel or Chris, any thoughts to share on music that you can recommend that works for you? Songs, any specific songs that you know that kind of bring you peace or joy or anything else? It's actually um, a great thing to think about. So there's uh, Farrell Williams, Happy. Yes. Um, That's always one that I have like set for my alarms. It just kind of snaps me into like a happy mode. Yeah, and he's yeah, talking like that song pisses me off, man. <laughs> I hate that song so much. But he's like, he's like, hey, you might have bad news, but just so you know, it's not gonna let me drag drag me down. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so uh, a lot of times classical music, um, sometimes chamber choir music's really peaceful. Um, yeah, um, sometimes it's spiritual stuff. It it just anything that's like got a positive message and uplifting and 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 harm, you know, even with harmonies like the Beach Boys or. Um, can be uplifting to me. Oh yeah, th- actually, that's a really good one. The Beach Boys, mm-hmm. they totally do that. Sometimes a lot of the oldies music mm-hmm. does that for me. I love I love to listen to old music, like the fifties music, yeah, and a lot of the sixties music. I enjoy for getting into a good space. Uh, Chris, any thoughts on music recommendations or music that is good for the mental diet is nourishing. Um, music that's in minor key okay. tends to be melancholy in general. So if you go to YouTube and put in music in minor key, you'll get a lot of good selections that are in, you know, that are more melancholy. So a slower, more deliberate pace. Mm-hmm. Um, meditation music for the different chakras. That's very good as well. Yep. And also, um, what is it from Wingspan? Bull- Blackberry Bird. Okay. And that in the jazz piano form is excellent. That is perfect for relaxation. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm really glad. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Uh, I agree. Just something positive, encouraging, and uplifting. I know that um, I start my day with music. And uh, depending upon what I'm doing. So I have a rebounder. And so I have uplifting morning music for that. And then I go into a time of body stretching, full body stretching. And so it's more contemplative uh, like that. So that's how I use music first thing in the morning. Love that idea. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Can, I, just, can, I also just... add, can I also add Native American flute music? Like, can, like in the canyons, like playing flutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Love it love it and uh, uh, i also have a native american uh chant that i use in the morning too um and i'll i'll throw it in the chat over on facebook messenger when we're done here but um it's uh called wende yaho and it's just you know acknowledging the creator of the you know universe for the day and it's a place that i use for prayer oh my gosh i love it i love it i have a I have a playlist called feel good music and it's got a lot of this stuff and I've just been putting it together over years. Any song that, you know, it's got a lot of stuff that's spiritual music and spiritual artists. It's got stuff like even John Denver songs that are about nature and stuff like that and oldie songs and everything, but uh, it gets please, me into that zone. Please share it in the group chat. Okay. If possible. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I, and it's kind of, it's, I'll try to figure out how to share it. It's oh, yeah. all my uh, music. Hey, if that's list. something that's possible. 
Yeah. So I know it's like, I'm looking at it right now. It's the song Higher Love by Kygo and Whitney Houston. Uh, Annie song, John Denver. Um, Give Me Some Lovin' by the Spencer Davis group. You know, like uh, I've got you two in here. Um, even a bit of Elton John, a bit of the Beatles. Yeah, a bunch of different, bunch of different stuff in here um yeah so but that's a good idea for all of us is just have a music playlist for good mental diet now another thing is what do you like to look at this is good for mental diet what do you like to look at we can think about inspiring art inspiring photos plants surrounding yourself with more of the good stuff adding a picture to your workplace maybe like like anything we look at becomes part of our mental diet Okay, I'll show you guys an example of this. Let's go through a practical example to verify this. Okay, when in a good mood, do you generally perform better at your tasks and activities? Most people would say yes, right? Like, so here's this. I want you to imagine something sad, like a little puppy being left alone on a deserted island. You know, he's shivering and cold and lonely and it's getting dark. When you, when you hold that in mind, what's your mood at in a scale of one to 10? One being sad and 10 being happy. Thinking about this little puppy on its own in the, the island right what, what breed your favorite breed whatever that okay. is <laughs> if we if we prefer cats can we see a shivering kitty on the island yes yeah okay. i I, Pretty I, sad. I i'm more of a cat person than ever now in my life based on that straight <laughs> cat uh i'm not sure if you guys saw it but anyway yes. so you imagine you get yourself into a down mood and then just look at this just look at this and now, <laughs> see if that is instantly, now what is your mood one to 10, <laughs> right? That's mental diet right there. Sometimes we right. take life too serious and we just need a little bit of that in your life. That's a little pug therapy. You know, you can show this to a friend when they're having boy problems or girl problems, show it to a child who's <laughs> sick, keep it in your glove compartment for road rage. You know, there's, <laughs> anyway, you can always just show a silly photo to people. And, uh, but the whole point there is what you look at can change your mood for me looking at uh, crystals and gemstones like we keep a like amethyst and different gemstones around and just looking at it as like the creator's art uh definitely is very uplifting to us um patty any thoughts on good mental diet for stuff to look at that uplifts you um i love looking at travel places so i'll go on pinterest and i'll find uh just various you know beautiful places around the world and I'll do that and I have a collage of just islands and forests and stuff like that that I have um as a screensaver so it's helpful yeah yeah, yeah. but you know that's a I feel like Patty is like the poster child for good mental diet like she's got this stuff dialed in like we ask her like Patty's got this stuff figured out, everybody. No wonder she joined. No wonder she joined the call late. She's already got this stuff figured out. She's like, "I'll wait for you guys to catch up to get close no, to my level." That's not true. That's not true. I'm learning as I go. I'm really learning <laughs> as I go. But I, I will tell you this. Um, one of the things that I really like that Joel does well, you know, you talk about, you know, things that you look at. You know, just the sayings that Joel has throughout his office and space, and. Um, you know, I put up uh, a mantra uh, as a result in my office that I look at that I, I see it faces me, you know, while I'm sitting at my desk or standing at my desk. And so that's really empowering and encouraging. Oh my gosh, you reminded me of something too that I do. I'm not sure if you guys can see this. I'm outside right now. Yes. And one thing beautiful. I do every day is I look at this. That's Winneth. That's a, a dove. She lives in the flower pot and she's got a little baby in there. <laughs> Hey, Winneth. And uh, I look at them every day. We, uh, we, always have, we always have doves live on our balcony and have their babies here every year. Of, of course they do. And we always look at them and I work here beside them and, and we'll see them blinking back. Now, you can't see the baby at the moment, but sometimes when she's gone, it's just the baby there. And uh, it's always just uplifting just to see them here sharing our space with us. So, um. Does anyone have any thoughts on uh, any more thoughts on what to look at or even some of the best movies that are good for you? So if we wanted to all come up with a list of the best feel good movies, 
or the best movies that leave a positive imprint on you and how you show up in the world? Who has some thoughts on movies that should be added to that list? Oh, my favorite's Forrest Gump. Okay. Yep. That's also my wife Ashley's favorite movie. It's just, I love like this concept of like, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the world. You just have to be open to like life, doing the right, you have to do the right thing mm-hmm. and be open to it and just have perseverance. Like he always just, he always persevered. Yep. Yep. Steve Smith, do you have any ideas? Um, I just watched Top Gun Maverick a couple weeks ago. And I just, I really liked it because it was a Hollywood blockbuster without an agenda. I felt like, like it was just a feel good, very sentimental. Um, I liked how they did the, you know, flashbacks when, you know, Maverick would see Goose and different things. And, and it just, you know, had a good feel good, like unsurmountable obstacles, right? Like the crap they have to go through. And they're pushing themselves mentally and physically. And, you know, I just, I, I thought I would like it based on everything that I heard from other people, but I liked it even more. And I just walked out feeling really good because it didn't have a lot of trashy, you know, like there was implied, a little bit of sexuality implied, but there was no trashy stuff in it. You know, the language for the most part was very clean. And it was just kind of about, it, it was almost the story of remembering the past, but focusing on your future. And I, I really liked how they dealt with that and how they portrayed that. Mm. Um, and it's, you know, to me, it was probably the best um, sequel that I've ever seen. You know, I, I, I'm having a hard time thinking of a sequel that was that good. I liked it better than the original. Um, mm. But, you know, I just walked out and I felt really good and upbeat you know, for the next couple hours until I got home and went to bed. And so for me, it's like, it's the music, it's the memory, it's the nostalgia. And, you know, I'm getting pretty nostalgic the older I get, you know, I, I, you know, I got to spend time walking around my old high school and college when I went to my cousin's funeral last month. And I just got to do some stuff that I haven't done in a long, long time. And it just brought back, you know, mixed emotions, but a lot of good memories. So to me, that just had a really good feeling to it when I walked out. Love it. Love it. How about Patty Baker? Any thoughts? I would say Under the Tuscan Sun. It just has really beautiful scenery in it. And um, there's another one called Leap Year. And uh, it just had it's done in ireland and so uh again those are the ones that come to mind i am not a big movie tv person as you all all know all good Um, but those two all good i am gonna look up those two because of the referral source to me they are (laughs) already qualified they are already qualified now for me a bunch of them i like the pixar movie soul um, which is out. I really, I like Taxaw Ridge. I know it's a war film, but I think like, in spite of being a war film, there's a, within the darkness, you can really appreciate the light that shows up. Um, Les Miserables, I thought is a, is a, you know, the one with Hugh Jackman, uh, was, I thought was a beautiful film with a lot of good messages. Pay It Forward was another yeah, good movie good. that kind of inspires us to take initiative I really loved A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, the, the Tom Hanks movie about Mr. Rogers and a lot of the simple wisdom and morals in that film. Uh, the story of Bill W., the guy who started Alcoholics Anonymous, that movie he left a big impression on me and inspired me to you know, create a mental toughness support group held out of our house at a time when it was needed in the community for people. And uh, you know, Kung Fu Panda is another one. I think that, you know, simple and innocent, but I love messages from it. Like there are no accidents in the universe. Um, I had a good friend of mine recommend Life is Beautiful. So I just bought it. I've never seen it before. But, you know, when I was having this discussion, they recommended it. I also find any of the films about Jesus, I find very inspiring. I like to connect with his wisdom and bring more of his presence of his consciousness into my life. And I always find 
Uh, I walk away just a little bit more inspired every time. And it can be anything like on YouTube or anything like that, or any of the great saints, uh, Yogananda, St. Francis of Assisi, like a lot of those ones. I just watching content about some of the great saints um, can leave a good impact. So I think one of the things is when we're taking in content, uh, if you're watching a movie, I think it's a good idea to connect with the characters, like see yourself in one or more of the characters, right? Also, which characters in there are teachers for you, right? Watch for the moral mentors, you know, do a self check-in when you're watching the movie, think about how other people might react to the content just without, we don't want to write movies off for having some solely on the basis of its exploration into human darkness, because sometimes darkness may serve the light. Hence the re reason I bring up maybe Hacksaw Ridge or Les Miserables. It's like the darkness serves the light in the end. Um, and it gives us a glimpse into the capacity for transformation and triumph, right? You know, you can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. So we shouldn't just write stuff off and just be like, oh, no, no, it's too negative to start off. And then let the content marinate. So I think that's another good thing. So, uh, and then, you know, I think just, we may also want to consider just optimizing our environment. Environment is stronger than willpower. So does anyone have any thoughts on that, you know, on just optimizing environment as something we should do more of. Steve? Um, so over uh, Memorial Day last month, um, we we were going to go camping out of the Oregon coast and the weather really went sideways. So we ended up canceling the camping spot and getting uh, a hotel for three days, met our friends from Idaho. And I just really felt like I, I needed to get out of our town. Uh, I just needed a, a new zip code for a couple of days. I need new scenery. And as we were driving to the coast, you know, my wife said, you know, you really need to think about getting a podcast. And as soon as she said that, I had the context and the name of my podcast just hit me like out of nowhere. And I know it was because I was driving, I was opening myself up to going to an environment that was going to open up my you know, creative receptacles and just open my heart, mind and let go of stuff. And, you know, I got a lot of good ideas that weekend by being at the coast, spending time around the ocean, looking at Oregon's oldest lighthouse, um, walking in the rain. And that I truly believe had I stayed home, those thoughts would not have come to me. I would not have gotten that inspiration for several several topics but because i changed and put myself in a pleasant welcoming environment physically with my surroundings that i was able to get all that love it love it a pleasant uh, uplifting environment can lead to uplifting thoughts right <clears throat> and i think it's a you know i think to, to add to that i think uh yogananda to summarize the whole do more of subject, Yogananda had a, gr had a great quote. He said, concentration on great books, you know, great men or women, great problems, great doctrines and great facts and their lessons cannot but result in high thinking, right? So it's a matter of making a sincere effort to take advantage of that effect it can have on our life. Um, Hey, Brennan, can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah. Uh, right before I spoke, you said something. You said environment is more powerful than, and I love willpower. It. Willpower. Stronger okay. than willpower. That's a Yogananda <laughs> quote as well. Environment is stronger than willpower. Love it. Okay. So we need to, you know, um, Yogananda also said that the quickest way to banish temptation is to first say no and get out of that environment. Then reason it out later when calmness and wisdom return to you, right? So that's how we can set a healthy boundary on that. You know, so Patty, do you have any more thoughts on the, on this category of taking in wholesome content or anything else? Nope, I'm good. I, I really like the books too, you know, just taking in audio books and autobiographies. I'm reading uh, one called Supermensch right now. 
And uh, it is just about a guy who um, uh, is a, a manager for talent. Basically, he's a talent manager. And he talks about his life. He's retired now, but not in anything I'm interested in at all, you know, interested in rock star management or anything, but man, just hearing what's going on in that industry and how this guy turned himself around. And like you said, building on problems and things like that, it's really valuable information that I think can transfer into regular life. Love it. Love it. Now, Let's go into what we should do less of or avoid. You know, we, we may need to make a list of what we need to avoid or limit from our mental diet. This is important because nobody can do it for you. It's a do-it-yourself project. Only you can clean your mental diet. We need to learn to insulate ourselves from negative influences, protect our personal space from thoughts and intrusions from the negative world, right? The negative aspect of the world. We need to keep our guard up and not allow negative influences to enter our mental kingdom and make a mess of things, right? So, you know, for example, we need to avoid certain types of conversations and certain types of sources out there, you know? So I love a, I love a quote, uh, Ryan Holiday, great author, by the way, wrote great books. He's, a, he's doing amazing work. He said, the worst place to get the news it's from the news. <laughs> I think he nailed it with that one. His daily stoic book, I highly recommend, by the way. I loved it. Um, nice. But we might find that, you know, over the uh, Joe Tish and Davy Nayaswamy in their book, Touch of Love, they said that, you know, over the years, the news has become less informative and more filled with gossip and judgmental opinion, Right. And we don't need to open ourselves to the energies that seek only to stir up negative reactions. Now, once again, that's not all news. I think the news is a, can be a beautiful thing. And I, you know, honor and respect it. It's just a matter of being, you know, having some discrimination on the news sources we have. You know, sometimes people can say that, you know, one thing they need to do less of is indulging on the news feed on social media. It can add stress to an already stressful day. Just take a break from it or limit your exposure. You know, one thing you can do is, one thing I do is whenever somebody voices a problem focused thought, I just make sure that I set my setting that none of their stuff ever shows up on my feet again. They lack that discrimination. It's kind of like they're vomiting negativity out there. I'm like, I just want to see the positive stuff, right? Like, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, so that could be a way to just insulate ourselves from those influences. Just put nah, nothing show up from this person on my feet anymore, right? Because if we can't do anything about it, we don't want to fret over it. You know, so um, we just want to clean up our surroundings, maybe of anything that's disturbing or destructing, destructive to our intellect. Uh, any other thoughts on turn our mind away from the things that are provoking it? Even conversations at the dinner table or conversations with certain people, just turn away from it. Anyone else have any thoughts? Joel, do you have any thoughts on what should we do less of or avoid? Um, I mean, I think you kind of nailed a lot of them for me personally it's it's a lot of it's social media because i go there a lot as kind of like oh i'm gonna i deserve a mental break from work i'm gonna go like decompress here but then it just like funnels all the stuff back in um yeah and like you i've also found that tool helpful to just kind of like minimize the the junk in social media that's not helpful because it seems like there's like the majority of it isn't it's just people complaining and it's like complaining without even like a purpose of complaining. You're just saying, hey, you suck. Or like, hey, this is not right. It's not like coming up with a solution. It's not like saying, hey, you know, there's two sides to this. Like they both have a little bit of merit. Let's try to find a way out of this. Like what's what's the bigger thing here? What's the bigger truth? Um, it's yeah. So just, I guess, just minimizing it, avoding it. Um, yeah, is, is, is Mary Baker Eddy would say, stand Porter at the door of thought and only let in the things that you want realized in your experience. Um, yeah, you, you gotta be, you gotta be on it. Cause if you don't, if you're not on it, like who's going to do it for you, you're just going to be, you're going to let others decide for you. If you're just passively digesting everything that comes your way. Yeah. You're not owning who you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Steve, any thoughts? Um, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, just going back to, to, you know, you're going to go where you, where you focus. 
Mm -hmm. right? And, and that's it, right? I mean, if you're always focusing on, um, you know, the negative, we're always going to be unhappy. There is so much out there that we can find. Um, but there's also, you know, so much good. And, you know, I think just through a lot of our trainings, through Tony Robbins, all that, you know, to me, it just goes back to gratitude. And I really liked what Joel said, just thinking of it as, you know, is this a blessed activity? Is this making me better? Is this making someone else better? Is this helping? Because I, you know, I, I do the same thing, Joel. I take a mental break and I prefer to, you know, go to Instagram than Facebook because I follow some people that are posting pictures of their hikes or the places they go explore, especially in Oregon. And for me, it's more visual and I'm seeing places and I go, man, I really want to go check that place out. I've never heard of that. And, and so I try to go there. Um, but even then I spent too much time, you know, I need to get off it because there's still garbage all over it, you know, but um, I do like, you know, kind of that visual uplifting because I'll see, you know, sunsets and, and wildlife and different things that people post and, you know, but then again, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. I just, I need to limit my time on it. So I'm not getting distracted, um, you know, like Joel said, but a, a good positive mental break maybe of, you know, a quick, you know, something that's, uh, you know, quick hit and then I'm done is probably more where I need to focus. Okay, cool. Patty, any thoughts? I think um, what do we take in less of in order to sustain or our mental acuity? Is that what we're kind of answering? Yeah, that's what we're discussing. Any thoughts I, on that subject? Yeah. Carbohydrates. It will drain your, you, you, it'll drain your brain you eat too many carbs and all of a sudden your brain is like in a glucose coma and you can't think or anything. Um, you have, especially midday and you're dragging in the afternoon. So, you know, you have a lot of carbs and then you'll be so tired. You can't even focus. You've got to lay down, take a nap or whatever. And then you got to jack yourself up on, I don't know what caffeine, something else. So I say, if you're going to take in less of something in order to maintain your mental acuity is carbohydrates. You know, I think that's a really awesome answer and that you're bringing it back to physical diet can affect our mental diet as well, because when we take in physical junk, we lose our mental acuity as well. And so we should be mindful of that. It's a, it's a beautiful point. So here's what we could consider next is people, all of us could consider going on a mental diet, right? Just taking out the bad stuff, you know, sometimes people think it's painful to change, but just think how much more pain there will be if we don't change. How much more mental turmoil, wasted time, negativity. So for this, you just take a set period of time and take conscious control of all your influences. Eliminate the negative and destructive stuff and nourish yourself with the good stuff for like the next seven days, right? The next seven days. Just decide you won't indulge in any of the negative content. You know, and, and just know that this is an absolute must. You must be totally convinced that the quality of your life and who you are depends on this. Get really emotional about it because, you know, the best you is what people are here for, right? And that's how we can best honor and love those around us is making a sincere effort and participate in our own, uh, in our own journey, right? And this will help, you know, a mental fast like this will clear the mind and rid it of the accumulated mental poisons resulting from a faulty mental diet, right? Where we can remove the cause of our worried state, you know, which might be a lot of the stuff we're exposing ourselves to. And we can protect the purity of our mind, just avoid evil and seek, seek the good stuff and keep the mind pure, you know? So that would be the idea. And I think the next step would be, you know, how can you set yourself up for success? Could you make a detailed plan? If so, what would that involve? And then as you do this, pay attention to the beneficial changes in your thoughts and attitudes. It, but realize like there's, it's just an experiment. And if it doesn't work, you can go back to all the screwed up stuff 
right? But what you can also do is you can take the self-assessment after the mental diet, the one we did at the beginning where you score everything one to five. You know, I find myself getting nervous or frustrated, indulging negative thoughts, feelings of worry and everything else. And you can actually measure the result in yourself. So, um, and then a couple follow-up discussions we might get into is switch, like how to switch habits and the old shoe, just doing a deep dive on the company you surround yourself with and how it shapes who you become. But other than that, uh, a good idea moving forward after this discussion is to consider experimenting with a mental diet. Um, any final thoughts, key takeaways, or thoughts on the whole idea of a mental diet? We'll just do kind of like a final wrap up. Um, Joel, you want to start off? I think there isn't probably, at least for me, like a more important topic these days, because it seems like everybody's competing for your attention. And it's not hard you know, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. It's not hard to realize why, like, it's really just money. Like Facebook is there to make money. They're there to hold your attention. And if it's stuff that shocks you and that you get upset about, like you're going to interact with it longer and, and you're going to argue with people. And, you know, we've all been there. Right. <clears throat> and it's the same thing with the news. Like they can hold your attention longer if they show you the garbage mm -hmm. and they have, they sell. So anyways, I just think it's, for me, it's, it's, it's hugely important because like you said, like money, you can get more of time. Like that's it. Right. And this is all we're talking about how we spend our time. And like, do you want to spend it, you know, in anxiety and fear and discouragement? Because all you have to do is focus on what we're talking about. Folk, you know, just pick any of the, you know, shows on Netflix that focus on like, fear and betrayal and war and you know sinister stuff or focus on the news or focus on arguments or whatever you know and conversely if if you're proactive with your mental diet which again this is an awesome topic and very relevant for me um it just sets you up to to process everything every challenge that you have in life to process it in a in a in a good way to be in a better mental space to deal with things and be more resourceful i mean like it's a win-win-win and i you know, I think it might be a little more challenging for the younger generation um, that didn't know anything else, because I think a lot of us here, we grew up before there were cell phones, before there were computers, before there was like a lot of this junk. Um, and so I, it's not that hard for me to be like, oh yeah, there was a time when like I didn't get distracted by all this stuff. Let me just kind of channel that. But for you know, younger generations, it's, it's, it's always been there. So it might be a little more of a challenge, but I think it's of monumental importance. And I, I think, you know, a seven day challenge is awesome. Like, it's not that hard. It's not that hard to like take a little mental diet of the stuff that's not serving you. And, you know, like Steve and I talked about, like, just ask yourself, is it something that's, that's blessing you? Is it a blessing activity? Is it something that's leading you up higher, making you a better person? Well, what will, what I'm working on right now, like, have a benefit, like a positive benefit in my life? If not, why am I wasting time on it? Love it. Love it. Great points. Great points. Chris, are you there? Wanted to get Chris in next because I know he's popping in and out. Okay, Chris isn't there. Uh, Patty, did you want to share your key thoughts, or key, key takeaways, final thoughts, anything? I think there's integration in... Um your physical health, your spiritual health, and your emotional health as it relates to your mental health. And when you can um, be healthy in those four core areas, I think you live a life of purpose and, and fulfillment out of that. And you can not only give, but also grow in it. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. So thinking holistically about the many different mm -hmm. dimensions that contribute to us. And uh, Steve, final thoughts, key takeaways? Yeah, I just, you know, got to agree with Joel again, too. You know, I think it's uh, just just seeing where my focus is, because not only does it change my mental state, but the more time I spend wading through, you know, that kind of crap, the less productive I am in the other parts of my life where I need to be, right? If I'm spending and I say, oh, it'll just be five minutes and 45 minutes later, mm -hmm. I'm still on Facebook, you know, wearing waders and you know goggles and a hazmat suit and all of that then that's been a complete waste of time i could have done so much more i could have moved the needle on my business i could have 
reached out to a friend that maybe had a significant need. You know, I could have done something else. So I think for me, one of the thoughts I had was while trying to focus on the good, if I take a mental break, set a timer, you know, I get five minutes, seven minutes, whatever it is, that thing resets. And that's my 10,000 foot hard deck, like on Top Gun, I'm going back to Top Gun. You know, that's it that I have to commit, you know, for a week. If I take a mental break on something, it's got to be positive and it's got to have a timer. And then I get back to doing good things. And I think for me, that'd be really helpful. Excellent. Excellent. I think, I think part of it is to like knowing the difference between recharging. Sometimes we need downtime to recharge. You know, it's kind of like we, we maximize ourselves and just like plugging in a phone or an electronic, it needs to recharge time. Sure. Right. But then knowing the difference between recharging and just wasting time can be helpful. And knowing that sometimes we need to go on social media and consume content in order to better create content. And then sometimes we're just consuming mindlessly. And that's what we need to be careful of is be more discriminative in our consumption of social media. Chris, are you there at all? I can't tell if Chris is still there. He might be off. Anyway, I will wrap it up for us then. So I think ultimately what this comes down to is that, uh, each one of you are the hero in your life story and the influences you allow into your life will either help bring out and awaken your heroic qualities like love and compassion and courage and generosity of spirit, or the influences can awaken your cowardly qualities, fear and insecurity and worry. And it's a, uh, it's, it's all, it, <laughs> I'm just laughing at the comment. I just saw you throw up there. The <laughs> you were all the wind beneath my wings is what Steve has said. Um, yeah. So it all comes down to, you know, embracing the call to adventure of self-realizing your highest reality. And a lot of that is the conscientious use of your free will. And what you pay attention to is what you become in many ways. So uh, thanks for all of you for sharing your time and also the gift of sharing this with whoever might watch this recording in future. And we hope that it, it benefits you and brings value to your life and helps uplift you. And that's what we're here for to, as a, an act of love and generosity to everyone else out there. Strangers care. We care about you, whoever you are watching this recording. And we're doing this uh, to benefit all of you as well as we all continue on this journey from ignorance to understanding in all things. We are all in this together. Let's stick together. Let's build each other up, uplift each other and make the best of it as one team moving forward. Let's do go team on three. Everybody ready? Yes. All right. Go <laughs> team on three, Steve. I'm ready. All right. One, <laughs> two, three. Go team! Go team! Go team. These, these are wings. These are wings. angel wings. You're the wind beneath my wings. I was doing that to play to your... <laughs> I'm doing the Napoleon Love you guys. Dynamite Have a wings. great week. Have a great week. Be proactive. If you're not going to drive your car, who is? You got this. <laughs>